We're now live, you can go ahead. Welcome to our redistricting town hall. Before we get started, I wanna hand it over to Gilbert Martinez for a brief message for our Spanish speaking viewers. Gilbert. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la sesión informativa. Esta sesión informativa se está transmitiendo en vivo por nuestro canal de YouTube con interpretación al español. Para escuchar la versión en español, puede usar el link de YouTube que se encuentra en la página de Facebook del Condado de Sonoma. Gracias. Y ahora regresamos para atrás con Supervisora Hopkins. Thank you so much, Gilbert. I'm going to start out with just a few facts about the redistricting process, and then we're going to have an opportunity to hear directly from our chair and vice chair of the advisory redistricting committee. Um, so to start off with a little bit of an overview, redistricting does take place every 10 years after the federal census. During redistricting, election district lines for federal, state, county, and other local elected offices are redrawn to reflect new population data and shifting populations. Redrawing these maps provides a way for communities to ensure that Sonoma County's diverse communities are fairly represented and represented most importantly by a member of their community. The Sonoma County Board of Supervisors established the Sonoma County Advisory Redistricting Commission to advise and assist the Board of Supervisors with redrawing these supervisorial district boundaries. The commission is holding a series of public meetings to solicit input from the public on the composition of the maps. The commission will select its preferred maps or map for presentation to the Board of Supervisors, which will then make the final map selection. So a few questions that folks have been asking, you know, how does redistricting affect me? The new election lines will determine which communities are placed in each supervisorial district. And then the voters within each district will get to select one of their own as a county supervisor during an election. Another question that sometimes comes up are, what are communities of interest? Communities of interest are the overlapping sets of neighborhoods, networks, and groups that share interests, views, cultures, histories, languages, and values, and whose boundaries can be identified on a map. Some examples might include senior citizens, LGBTQI communities, residents who share a common language, or people who use the same transportation system and tend to have sort of the same, you know, similar schools and work and, and communities, particularly out in our rural areas. Some folks want to know, how does redrawing a map affect my community? Well, obviously, elected representatives establish many of the rules by which we live, including allocating the taxes that we pay, protecting the quality of the water that we drink and the air that we breathe and the ways that we keep one another safe and more secure. And that's what makes it so important to have representatives from our local community speaking for us at the elected level. Um, folks wanna know, can I draw my own map for consideration? And the answer actually is yes. There are a variety of tools available on the redistricting website from paper maps to an online mapping tool that you can actually use to draw your own recommended map. You can draw your own map or you can provide written input if you're not comfortable drawing a map. A lot of folks also want to know where can I submit my feedback or input. This is going to be a community driven process and so we would love to have your feedback and information. You can submit your feedback and maps with proposed district lines to redistricting 2021 and that's the numbers 2021 so redistricting 2021 at sonoma-county.org by October 15th, 2021, for consideration in draft maps. We also are holding a series of public meetings, including this one, which we are welcome, we're really hoping that you will submit some information and provide some feedback during the course of these meetings. Some of the upcoming other public meetings, in addition to this one, include October 5th at 8.30 a.m. We're going to have a Board of Supervisors meeting that is also an advisory redistricting commission meeting. On October 18th at 4 p.m., there will be an advisory redistricting commission meeting. And October 22nd at 4 p.m., there will also be an advisory redistricting commission meeting. And October 25th at 4 p.m., there will also be another advisory redistricting commission meeting. So you all are going to be very busy, I believe, um, on the ARC. And thank you so much um, to Chair Ed Sheffield and to Vice Chair Ana Horta for their service on this. But before I hand it over um, to your Chair and Vice Chair of the ARC, I do want to go ahead and hand this over to Shalise Tilton, who is going to be providing some redistricting updates and has a presentation for everyone today. Shalise. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here. My um, company name is National Demographics Corporation. My name as the is Shalise Tilton, 
And the reason uh, why I'm here is to gather input from you, from the public, from the uh, commissioners, from the board on how you want the lines drawn. And we want those lines drawn, as was said, so that they can fairly represent your communities. And get, we want input from you on what those communities are. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and give you a quick background on uh, what redistricting is, some of the, uh, the rules we have to follow, and some of the tools that are available. What you're seeing on the screen is the existing map as drawn, and you can see that, that we have um, five districts drawn representing uh, the county. Each of when they were, these were drawn based on the 2010 census, and each of the districts, although they're different in size, they are population balanced. Based, that was, this was based on 2010. So our goal is to redraw the lines based on, of course, the 2020 census data. The process is driven by the Fair Maps Act and the Fair Maps Act requires that we have a set number of hearings and the county added a different layer. They assigned um, the Advisory Redistricting Commission to gather additional input from the public on these communities of interest and how the public wants to see the, um, the composition of each of the districts. This gives you a snapshot of what has taken place um, so far. We've had uh, meetings uh, I mean in June, July, and meeting in August. Uh, we had some uh, training sessions, uh, virtual training sessions that you can go back and, and view the material. And then now we're in the process of hoping getting the public to start drawing and submitting maps. As many of you know, the census, most, I think all of you know, the census was delayed. We did get the raw census data from the uh, Federal Census Bureau on August 12th. What's happening now is the California statewide database uh, must take that raw census data, zero out all the federal prisons, and reassign those prisoners to their last known home addresses. That's taking place now. They expect to have completed that work by September 20th. Uh, what we don't know is um, in what format they're going to be releasing uh, those data. So it, it will take, a pro it will take uh, probably two weeks for NDC um, to take the data and um, configure it so that it's usable and uh, assimilated uh, for the uh, for the County of Sonoma's um, database. And then um, after the data is released, there will be a one week mandated waiting period before the county or the county's consultants can release draft maps. So we're uh, hoping to be able to report back on October 5th to the Board of Supervisors to give an update on that official prisoner adjusted data and how the existing districts um, look as far as population balance. And we'll be having a series of other meetings. We um, actually have two deadlines for the public to submit maps. If you have your maps ready, submit them by October 8th because we want to make sure that your maps are available for the commission to start reviewing on October 18th. The commission asked for a second deadline and we've given that of October 15th. I want to encourage you to get them in as soon as possible because you can see there's a um, uh, very short amount of time between the 15th and the 18th to prepare those maps. So um, October 8th is the ideal deadline. You do have up until the 15th to submit maps. Once maps are submitted, we wanna hear from the public. Uh, we want to uh, know what you like about the maps, what you'd like to see changed, and, and the commission will be narrowing it down to the um, to focus maps. Although, you should know that all maps that are submitted will always um, remain on the table. So the commission, while well, the commission may identify, identify about three focus maps, all, all maps submitted um, will be produced by NDC and um, always remain in, uh, in the listing for the board to consider and the public to comment on. The board of supervisors will have 
a meeting on November 2nd to discuss focus maps, and then on November 16th to identify a preferred map uh, with formal adoption on December 7th. The uh, final date to, to adopt a map is December 15th. The federal laws that we must follow are equal population. It's equal population, as I mentioned, based on the 2020 census. However, California has added the requirement that we zero out the state prisons and reassign those state prisoners to their home addresses. When drawing, we also must follow the Federal Voting Rights Act. So there can be, um, maps can't be drawn in a way that would dilute the voting strength of our protected class groups. And no racial gerrymandering, meaning that maps cannot be based solely or predominantly on race. That can be one of the factors, but not the sole factor or the only guiding factor. The second column is the California law. It's uh, under the Fair Maps Act found in the elections code. And starting in January, 2020, the uh, law was changed so that we have prioritized criteria that must be followed. First is geographically contiguous. So each individual district must have one single solid border. It can't be made up of various pieces to comprise a district, just one, one solid border. Undivided neighborhoods and communities of interest. These are socio uh, these are geographic areas that share similar socioeconomic uh, concerns or other interests, um, provided they should be kept together for their fair and effective representation. The third criteria is cities and, and um, census designated places. So wherever possible, we need to keep those cities and census, census designated places whole meaning not divide them between two different districts if possible. It's not always possible. The fourth is easily identifiable boundaries. Mostly we're talking about major streets, waterways, um, waterfronts, mountains, um, those type of things that help us to identify the boundaries. Compactness is not necessarily the size or even the shape. But what compactus does mean is that we do not bypass one group of people to get to a more distant group of people. And we cannot draw districts to favor or discriminate against a political party. Those are the federal and state laws. There are other traditional redistricting principles that are considered when maps are drawn. One of those is minimizing voters that are shifted from different election years. So presently, each of the districts is assigned to either a 2022 or a 2024 year. So if we have to adjust those lines and we have to shift voters from one district to another, we want to try wherever possible to shift them to a district that shares the same election year. Another consideration, if all the state and the federal laws are met, is respecting voters' choices. And if it's possible to produce an option that avoids head-to-head -head, uh, contest between incumbents, then we'll present that option. Uh, we always say that we want the voters to decide who has earned re-election as opposed to a demographer's pen where incumbents would be drawn into the same district and voters would only be able to select one. We can consider future population growth. However, we still must abide by the equal population. There's a little bit wiggle room in equal population we can have no more than a 10% difference between the least populated district and the greatest populated district. So when you're talking about future population growth, uh, you can slightly underpopulate a district if you know there's going to be future growth, but it's still, it's very limited. It's, you still need to be within that percentage of uh, no more than 10% deviation overall. And preserving the existing core of uh, of the current districts is often a consideration as well. Because the population data was delayed, we did uh, produce some estimates of what we think the population data will be. And what you're seeing on the screen is a, a summary of those estimates if we applied them to the current district. Now, if we applied those to the current district as they are today, you will see that um, we are actually population balanced um, because we are under 10%. I'm looking at the third uh, row of data where it says estimated percentage of deviation. 
And in each of the districts, it gives us a percentage that it is uh, that deviates from the ideal. And in the far right column, it shows the overall deviation between the least populated district. In this case, that would be District 1 and the greatest populated district, which would be District 5, and it's 7.35%. So if, if the county, uh, in the, if the commission were to look at the existing districts and, and believe that they meet the state and federal criteria, um, then it could be an option to consider the existing districts as a viable map along with the other maps that are submitted. Um, if the official population the official census data that will come out at the end of September if, if it's near our population guesses. The next category that I'm showing is the citizen voting age population. And these are US citizens that reside in the county. They're 18 years of age. We've broken them down by, um, by a protected class group. So you see Hispanic in the first category, and know that when we're speaking of, about Hispanic or Latino, the census asks a question, are you Hispanic or Latino? It's not broken out. So um, you can consider that when it says Hispanic there on the graph for it to either be, to, to be Hispanic or Latino. When looking at, uh, at the percentage, percentages across the board, you would look for percentages um, perhaps that are higher in a single district, if there is a geographically concentrated area of your Hispanic citizen voting age population. Right now I'm seeing from this graph, this uh, summary that district four has the highest percentage at 21%, where the city overall is 16%. If these estimated population uh, numbers are, are close to what the, um, Official numbers will be each district should have about uh, about 100,000 people in each district. 99,954 is what um, uh, it is when you divide the total count by five. When I mentioned the total population, that's every person, whether they are U.S. citizen or non-U.S. citizen, whether they are um, a voting age or not. So that those total breathing people in the county. One thing I need to uh, mention when we're looking at this graphic, when we're looking at total population as far as balancing the districts, uh, the, legislation, the, the legislation does require that we use the um, California redistricting database population number. So we are not able to use a different number because state law mandates what number we used. We, we are to use, and that is the official federal census data adjusted to reassign the state prisoners, and zero out the federal and state prisons. We do have, and with each map, we'll be providing different demographic categories that help will help you in evaluating the maps. Each map will come with the same set of, of socioeconomic data. What you're seeing on the screen is the first two lines are just what I showed you on the previous slide. And then we have voter registration for November, 2020. We have voter turnout for November, 2020 and voter turnout for November, 2018. We also show categories as far as age, immigration status, language spoken at home, language fluency, education levels, the number of children at home, um, household income and housing status. And often this is a good um, indicator when you're looking at various communities of interest. If, if perhaps the, your focus is household income, then you can see if there is a higher percentage in one of the districts that shows that there is a higher um, concentrated uh, grouping of people who have that shared common interest in one particular district. All maps that are submitted, whether you submit them um, on a paper napkin, use a Chamber of Commerce map, use a AAA map, use one of our maps that we provided in the toolkits, or you've used one of our online tools, it doesn't matter how you've submitted it, we will professionally uh, produce all maps so that they can be evaluated equally. So each map will have a depiction, of, a color depiction, such similar to this, of, of the districts that you've drawn, 
And then each map will come with its own demographic summary. I had just showed you in the previous slides uh, this same snapshot in detail. We don't, we, as I mentioned, we do not um, uh, weed out any maps or eliminate any maps. All maps that are submitted are drawn up. It's a 100% transparent process. So that you know, if you're drawing a map, you're participating at the same level as everyone else. Now, there, um, it is common that some maps will be submitted and they've missed one of the legal requirements, such as they aren't, um, they've drawn districts that aren't contiguous, or perhaps they've drawn districts that aren't population balanced. We will still produce those maps. We will just put a big red indicator on there, um, indicating what the, what the issue would be. And then if, if the commission or the board liked a particular map that maybe was not legally compliant, then we could start to work with how we, what changes would need to be made to make that map compliant. Very important that we hear from the community about your neighborhoods. Um, what, uh, what is your neighborhood? What are the geographic boundaries? We're talking a county. Sometimes these are larger areas. Um, I'll give an example, um, County of Santa, Santa Barbara. There's lots of discussion uh, where uh, UC Santa Barbara, which district should that be in? Uh, right now that it's in a district with a bunch of uh, unincorporated areas, farming areas. And so the question is uh, really what are the boundaries of Isla Vista is where, where that district's called. And then, um, so first we wanna define what those boundaries are. And then we want to know, um, we want to hear about that neighborhood. Where does it best align with? Who does it align with? Um, same with, we, we heard a lot about other, maybe particular farming communities and they align with a particular um, uh, nearby city as opposed to another city. So these are the type of things on a county level we want to hear, hear from. Beyond neighborhoods, um, there are communities of interest such as uh, shared characteristics, that same social or economic interests, maybe shared history, same uh, types of uh, uh, the folks maybe have or, or have the same types of careers or um, they're impacted by certain policies or certain concerns. Sometimes concerns can be things like fires or floods or um, traffic or um, homelessness or safety. There, so there are things other than neighborhoods that bring a community together. We're talking on a county-wide level, sometimes there's lack of services in certain areas. Um, so those would be an all shared concern. And then once we know about these communities, we want to hear would that community benefit from being in a single district? for its fair and effective representation. The definition of community of interest is a population that shares common social or economic interests that should be included within a single district for purposes of its fair and effective representation. And I do wanna point out communities of interest do not include relationships with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. We have various tools that are available for one to use. Um, if you want to visit, I believe it was the September 1st workshop, we, uh, the recording, we could go into some detail on how to actually use these tools. And there are on the website also some demonstration videos and some guides you can link to of how to use them. On the next um, upcoming screens, I'm going to show quick snapshots of each of these tools. Oh, sorry, I, there we go. Um, this particular snapshot is a snapshot of the county's website, and this is where you would access the tools. So if you go to sonomacounty.ca.gov slash redistricting, then you can uh, scroll down and learn how to draw a map, and that's where you'll be able to access all of the tools. Story map is not a mapping tool where you can draw maps, but you can actually look at different maps. Uh, and sometimes this is helpful if you're trying to identify a particular community of interest. 
So it's it's a map where you can scroll scroll through and analyze data. We have overlapping uh, other uh, maps from other jurisdictions as well. The online interactive review map is a map that you'll use large, uh, for many different reasons. One of them you'll be using when you use your paper maps because as you'll see, the paper maps don't show you the great detail of the streets. So you can bring up this interactive review map. It works very similar to Google Maps and you can zoom in very closely to particular areas. So for example, if right now you're looking where that green um, district is, you could zoom in very closely and actually see what streets those boundaries follow. Also, when you're using the paper maps, you can click on and make sure that the, um, the, the population units with the uh, counts are activated or the population units with the unit IDs. I'll show you what that means in the upcoming slides. And then you can actually uh, zoom in closely. It corresponds with your paper map and you can see the streets. You can also change the base layer so you can have a satellite view. The simple map drawing tool, uh, it, we've divided the county into uh, population units. They largely follow the same uh, as the census tracts. We've given you the population count. This way it will be easier for you. If you want to draw a map on your own without using one of the online tools, you can use a paper map. And all you do is you take a marker and you just draw the outline of what, you're what you'd like your district to be. You can know if it's population balanced by, um, by uh, counting up all of the population counts that are, in, that are identified in each of the districts. If you don't want to use your own calculator and you're familiar with Excel, you can use an Excel spreadsheet to do that. So you would first draw your map and then you would bring up the map that has each of those areas, those population units um, identified numerically and it corresponds to a spreadsheet that will enter, do the math for you. So you would just uh, uh, enter your assignments on the spreadsheet of, uh, for each of the population unit numbers. And then you can bring up a tab that will show you how you did as far as total population in each of the districts if you're balanced. And it will also give you that citizen age, citizen voting age population broken down by our, our protected class uh, groups. District R is becoming one of the most popular tools that we have out there because it's very easy to use and it does provide some good information. It gives you the total population as you draw. So you simply just activate the paintbrush feature, you select a color and start drawing your first district. When you have this population tab opened up, it'll show you how well you're doing is coming close to the ideal population. You can also activate various data layers so you can see the existing districts. And then you can color code, you can bring up a thematic map that would show various things about the socioeconomic um, interests of, of a community such as um, Spanish spoken at home or uh, the percentage of renters in a particular area. So it would show you the higher concentrated areas of those by having a darker purple color as opposed to a lighter pur purple color. Calipers is a more powerful online redistricting tool. So those who um, are a little bit more familiar with um, working various uh, softwares are very comfortable in using Caliper. Those who have never used it can follow the tutorial and it's you can get greater detail than the um, district R, and you can also get more um, uh, more information on your proportions for many more categories other than just the citizen voting age population. So we're hoping to get feedback and public discussion on what is your community and what are its boundaries? What are other areas in the county? What are their boundaries? And what communities images should be kept in a single district for effective and fair representation? Uh, I wanna add to this, what communities align with one another? What makes sense for a particular community? Um, which communities should be together and which communities are very different and maybe should be in different districts? 
And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about the redistricting process or about the mapping tools. Thank you so much um, for that. Really appreciate all of that excellent information. Very soon, we will be um, shifting to go ahead into a public question process. But before we do, I would like to um, introduce our ARC chair, Ed Sheffield, as well as our ARC vice chair, Ana Horta. And so I'll hand it over um, to our chair, Sheffield, and then he can pass it along to vice chair Horta. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Hopkins, and thank you, Shalise, for um, getting us started with this presentation today. I have to say it's been an honor um, serving on this commission, uh, understanding that it is such an important task um, and that um, it, it's challenging, yes, but when we know that we're moving in the right direction and that our ultimate goal, our mission to serve the people of the community as best we can and be as inclusive as possible, um, that's the takeaway. That's what makes me feel good about the work that we are doing. Thank you so much, Chair Sheffield. Vice Chair Horta. Everyone, um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that all of you are here. This is like um, uh, Commissioner and Chair Sheffield has said, a very important process. Um, it only happens every 10 years. And this is the very first time that we're having the opportunity to, um, to do this together. Um, and therefore we really, really welcome any comments, any opinions from the public. Um, it's very important for us commissioners to know um, and understand the situation, to know those communities of interest. So um, please, please, uh, it's such an important process and we want you to be part of it and be involved on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really wanna thank both of you for stepping forward and for really all of the members of the ARC for their service. I know this is a big commitment of time and energy. And I just really appreciate you standing up to represent communities and to bring that community voice and perspective um, so that we really do have a, a good collaborative process that will ultimately go to the Board of Supervisors. So thank you both for your leadership. We are going to go ahead and transition into questions now. And I've got a list of questions that are coming in from Facebook. Um, one question is what kind of input can I provide if I'm not comfortable with maps or don't have online access? That might be a good question. I'm thinking for Shalise um, to kind of describe the best ways to feed information into that process. Uh, yes, so we'll get, we, we, we expect to get many people who don't want to draw a map, but yet do um, know the county and know what communities should belong together and which communities don't. So uh, submitting through email, the email, um, website that we'll, we can show on the screen as well. Uh, we want to hear from you. And if you could be very specific, either mention uh, if you know the um, name of the census designated place or the city. A census designated place is a place that most of you identify with, but it's not an actually incorporated city or even the geographic area. And uh, let us know, um, uh, what other communities align with it, or perhaps look at the existing map and give us an idea of what works and what doesn't work with the existing map. That's also helpful as well. I would also extend that question um, to Chair Sheffield and Vice Chair Horta. You know, I, I know that you all are leading a number of public meetings, and I'm guessing that you're hearing from members of the public during those meetings. I don't know if you'd like to comment on how folks might be able to lift up their voices and be part of this process. Sure, I'll start us off. Um, you know, we, and, and I give credit to the supervisors, to you, Chair Hopkins, for um, selecting this commission. We were selected because of our role in the communities, um, that we were identified as people who could reach out to, um, to neighborhoods, to um, maybe even communities that have had less of a voice historically. And equity has really been the focus um, from all of our meetings, from, from our very first meeting. We started out with 15 
uh, commissioners, I think, that were identified last winter. And, and the supervisors expanded that to 19 um, just so that we could be uh, more representational. Um, so, you know, with the expertise, the skills of the commissioners, um, along with our focus on equity, I think that's because that was our starting point. I think that that's where we're going with this. We want to make sure that everybody is included. If you don't have the 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 means um, to use some of the tools that are given, um, especially if you don't have, um, if you can't use the interactive maps, the paper maps are great. We've all been trained. We had a special meeting on on. Um, on train, it was just on training on how to use these maps so that within we could take that out to the community. We can show others um, how to use these skills. And then we can also really hone in on these areas, these, these, these neighborhoods um, that maybe we're familiar with. And then, um, and then as, as we, we start working with folks to draw these maps, um, we can make sure that we have a little bit more inclusion. Anything to add to that, Vice Chair Horta? Sure, yes. Um, it's important to, so the, the commissioners and the commission has recognized that this is a, a very important project, a very important process. So we have two ad hoc com uh, committees. One is the community outreach and the other one is an equity committee. So we're really working on those two aspects um, to really um, get the best out of this process. Um, and, and we, I want everyone to understand that just like Ed said, we have been trained to help people with the maps. And also we do have flyers and paper maps available to hand out to people. You can email um, the redistricting email asking for these. You can reach out to the commissioners. Our names are listed on the webpage for the redistricting. And um, we will be very happy to talk about these, to um, guide you through this process. Uh, it's like Shalisa said, the timeline is very limited because of the late release of the census data. So we're under a lot of pressure and, and we don't have a lot of time, but we do wanna make the best out of these and we really um, reach out to us and let us know how we can help you with this, how we can help you understand. Thank you so much for that great information. Um, next question is, when will the county receive official census data? Shalise, would you mind reminding us of when that will happen? Yes. Uh, so uh, the federal census came out August 12th. And what's happening right now is the California statewide database is zeroing out all of the state prisons and all the federal prisons and reassigning those state prisoners to their home addresses. That uh, they, once they complete that project and they're expecting to complete that on September 20th, that will be known as the official redistricting data. So we'll have that on September 20th. From there, there's a one week waiting period before the county or the, or the county's consultant can start drawing maps. Now, once that comes out on September 20th, there, um, because there will be a, a great deal of work that needs to be done, uh, we, we don't, what we don't know is the format that, the, that those data will be released. And then we'll need to um, assimilate that into the county's redistricting um, data set. That could take up to two weeks. Um, and uh, that's just the, that's nothing we can do about that other than is we're waiting to get it just like everyone else. And as soon as we get it, we'll be working to have that available. But that's not slowing us down. We are moving mm -hmm. forward again. We know that, that there are setbacks. We knew that we started <clears throat> months behind. Um, and so, you know, we have folks in the community already working on maps. Um, we are um, out there already reaching out to community groups to get their input. And um, we're starting to receive input as well on the um, county uh, email uh, um, that is set up specifically for questions, concerns, and input on, on the map drawing process. 
Great. And I do see that we have a question from Martin Espinoza um, from the Press Democrat. So if we could go ahead and unmute him and then we'll return to the audience questions after Martin goes. I think Martin, you're unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um, Shalise, based on the estimates that you went over um, on page five of your PowerPoint, if those estimates hold, what sorts of changes would we expect uh, given those population? And I'm not going to ask about each one of those categories, but just the, the population estimates. What, what sort of changes would we expect to see in terms of the size of you know, it's would one of those districts shrink? Would one of them grow? What can, if these hold? If these estimates hold? Yes, uh, if the estimates hold, uh, and uh, the, then the they, they the county could have a population balance map as it exists today. So, if the estimates hold, then it's possibility that if the um, commission and the board of supervisors felt that the existing districts were the best met the federal and state laws, then they could adopt the existing map without change. And so, so there aren't, those numbers aren't drastically changed over the last 10 years that, we, that uh, they would have to be changed just based on population alone. It's, it will all depend on where the population growth took place. And right now it, it looks like it's, it's taken place enough, uh, it's been distributed enough evenly throughout the county that um, if, if our estimates are true now, um, well, we will have to wait and see when the official data comes out. I have another question just to follow up on neighborhoods. Um, this is a question that I've always been asked by my editors to define certain neighborhoods, who has the final word? And I'm sure if you go out and you ask members of the community what their neighborhood looks like or what their geography is, there are, you're gonna come up with a lot of different answers. Who's gonna have the final word on what those neighborhoods are? That's a good question because even in very small jurisdictions where we have planning departments that provide very precise boundaries for neighborhood associations, um, you'll hear from the public that say that's not a how it, that's not a, not at all how it is in reality. So it, we rely heavily on public testimony. Um, once we get people defining the geographic boundaries of certain communities, um, on the back end here, I draw them up as maps, and then we'll overlay them when um, when drawing a map for consideration. <laughs> So it's very important that we hear from the community and sometimes they won't align, but then the commission will deliberate and look at the maps and decide, okay, um, this one we think best meets um, what we've heard from the public and what's been submitted. It, Martin, I, I think that's a, a really good question. I just wanna follow up on what, what Shalise said is hearing from the public. We, we you know, at, from again, as I, as I stated before, from our, our very first meeting, we did want, um, there was a definitely an insistence from commissioners to focus on equity. And as uh, Vice Chair Horta brought up, we had a, um, um, it was decided that we would have a special ad hoc on equity and another ad hoc on community outreach. And um, in our, in our meeting just this past Monday on the 13th, um, it was devoted entirely to equity. We brought in Dr. Rosa Perez to lead a panel discussion from folks within our community who, who again were identified for their connectedness to specific neighborhoods. And you know, we we even had a discussion where we were pinpointing and 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 naming exactly what these neighborhoods are, where they are, and 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 um how and who we connect with within these neighborhoods to make sure that we capture their voice. I think that that is probably our greatest challenge is to give voice for people who have been underserved historically have been underrepresented in the in the community and we know that they've been marginalized we've heard from them in the past but we want to give voice to that as we take on something that has never been done in in um, the county before in drawing up these lines was to include their voice include them in the process and I would just 
add um, that I agree with absolutely everything that Chair Sheffield um, and Shalee said. This is obviously my first census redistricting, but we did go through a process of creating municipal advisory council districts in West County. And it was awesome to see the community come together. You know, we came in with these draft maps and they're like, nope, don't, don't draw that line at that river or that ridge top. It's really this road because all the people on this road, they go to that grocery store. So they're all part of the same community. They go to the same post office, you know, and, and it was literally just, you know, cro crossing out hash marking over the lines that weren't right and drawing in new lines and then figuring out how, once we got those lines right, how we then balance the population which is the tricky part, right? Um, to make sure that we had equitable population across the districts. But it was so amazing to see the community. And, and what was shocking to me was the community really coalesced because these are neighborhoods. These are communities that have identities and everyone does know where those boundaries are even though they don't formally exist you know, on a street line or you know, something like that. So I just, I can't wait to see the work that the ARC community outreach uh, group does because I think that's gonna be really critical and also really appreciate the attention being given to equity. And I know that um, the chair and the vice chair have been really focusing on both of those things. Thank you. It's just gonna be great not to have to go to nextdoor.com to figure out where these neighborhoods are. Thank <laughs> I, you. No comment on next door. <laughs> My lips are sealed. Um, with that, I will return to the questions from um, members of the public. There was a question, are there any early indications of changes to the county's population based on the preliminary data? And Chalice did share that information. I think this question came in um, before those slides went up, but we did see, for instance, sort of a loss of population in East County and District 1, an increase um, in District 5, which I think validates my staff and my team always saying, we have more work than everybody else. Well, we did have some more people than everybody else. Um, and that kind of showed the trajectory and trends there. So if anyone missed that, I would encourage you to just kind of, once this concludes, go back to that section of the meeting on Facebook and you'll be able to get that information. Um, and and next, uh, Supervisor, we'll Supervisor Hop, yes. Um, so some, some folks may have looked up the uh, raw data that was sent um, out by the uh, federal census. And actually you can go on the, the um, Department of Finance and look at those figures. So it looks like our estimate was a little high at, um, and the actual numbers are coming in at 488,863. Now I give you that number verbally because that number will change. And I don't want, I don't want to mislead you to thinking, okay, that's the number we're going to use um, because we'll have to readjust it to reassign um, state prisoners to their home locations but um, it's probably not gonna change that drastically. So it will probably be closer to 490,000. Thank you for that. The next question that I have is how much money does the county spend on redistricting and how often is it done? We did um, talk about how often it's done, which is after the decadal census. Um, and in terms of the money, you know, I would have to look up the board item that we authorized, but I don't know if Shalise, if you know off the top of your head, what sort of the contract for your services is, and that is certainly information that I can look up and share at a future date, or if Chair Sheffield or Vice Chair Horta have any information on that, I can remember that. Okay, Shalise, any information? Uh, I don't have that readily available right now, but we can certainly get that for you. Yes, and it was, I know, it put in a public board meeting, but we have lots of uh, agenda items with lots of different dollar amounts, so it's not at the top of my head right now. Chair Sheffield? Oh, I just, you know, I, I, I've seen that number. I just, I don't, I don't want to state it without having it in front of me, but I think I found it on the redistricting website. I, I scrolled through maybe to the, 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 the agenda from or the minutes from the first, the first uh, supervisor meeting, not the, um, not the art commission meeting, but I did see that number at one point. That's a good suggestion to look there. Um, next question, and I will give this to the chair and vice chair of the ARC, which is what considerations is the ARC taking into account in giving the Latinx community a voice? Great question. Do you want to um, <laughs> do you want to take a stab, uh, Vice Chair Horta? Sure. Um, well, um, we have been doing uh, community outreach, like we mentioned. <clears throat> we have two ad hoc communities. One is community outreach, and the other one is the equity. Um, also, I, um, all of the commissioners have really made a mission to to do as much, um, you know, spreading the word and spreading the information as possible. Um, I have been to several radio programs and we are doing these uh, public meetings as well. 
to uh, capture the voices and to reach to the Latinx community and other communities that are and have been underserved. Um, so uh, that's 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 what we have been doing so far. I mean, we're again really committed to these. Reach out to us uh, with any questions if you want any more information. Personally, you can you can reach out to me as well. Um, and uh, you know, like when I have been part of these uh, radio programs, I have done it in, in Spanish. So hopefully, uh, everyone is hearing from these. And you know, here we're doing another public meeting with uh, translation as well. So that's what I have to say. Yeah, and I think you know, as we as we identify and tap community leaders to help us. You know, I think the initial steps are developing trust, maybe where trust, um, it, you know, needs to be earned. Um, I think that, you know, as we as we move forward, because we have, again, made equity the focus, knowing um, which populations in our communities have been marginalized for so long now, um, just, you know, that we do so in a very thoughtful way, in a very intentional way, um, and we do everything we can to in sure that there is inclusion. I want to add too that many of the commissioners are part of the Latinx community and other communities as well. So um, we, we come from and we understand many of the issues that the Latinx community face. So that, that right there, I think it's a, it's a pretty good thing. And, and to give credit again to Supervisor Hopkins and her colleagues on the board for again creating a commission that is as as diverse and as representational as we are. Thank you so much um, for your service on the ARC again. And you know, I we're actually I don't have any more questions from members of the public, so we'll be wrapping it up. Um, you know, I wanted to say personally that one of the things that inspires me about this process is actually how can we achieve greater diversity in our elected officials. Um, you know, and so I'm really looking forward to hearing recommendations from the ARC that actually empowers communities of color and um, communities of interest and, um, you know, potentially opens up new pathways of running for office. Um, because when I look at my colleagues, I love working with my colleagues, um, but we are not a very diverse group. And I think that there is, you know, a real opportunity here to look at those lines and to ask, do they make sense? Or do they sort of actually disempower communities in ways that have happened for decades and decades and decades and that we've just never really taken a look and, and listened to the community and had a grassroots community-based process for before? Um, so that's kind of a note that I personally wanted to end on, but I actually want to give the last words to um, you know, Vice Chair Horta and Chair Sheffield to share any of their thoughts or anything that they want to share um, with members of the public about this process going forward. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh no, go ahead, Anna, if you have anything to add. Sure, I just wanna say again that uh, this is a very important process and we really welcome your opinion, your, your voices. This is an avenue this is how things work. We feed from each other. We, um, we want to help you, but we need your help as well. Um, so we're all in this together. So participate. Well said, um, Vice Chair Horta. I, maybe I just want to add, and maybe, you know, I, I, final words for the public is that they need to know that Sonoma County, um, that they've, we've never undergone this before. Um, this is a new process. Commissioners, commissioners and staff are new to this. Um, there's no template. We're doing our best to spearhead a public process that is as inclusive and as welcoming as it can be. Um, and maybe we're laying some foundation, some groundwork for the next census process 10 years down the road, we'll learn from from the the mistakes that we made this go around. But you know, again, knock on wood, you know that we're we're doing everything we can to make sure that there that that there are no mistakes. That we are uh, including everybody, and we're reaching out um, again to the best of our ability. 
I do appreciate um, Chair Sheffield ending on that note of, you know, this is a new process for us and in many ways, right, democracy is an ongoing experiment, whether we 244 or so years old in the United States, um, you know, and, and still evolving and adapting at a local level. So thank you again so much um, for your leadership on the ARC and I can't wait to learn from you and with you as we move forward in this process. With that, I want to thank everyone, um, especially our interpreters for supporting our work this evening. Um, and for all of the staff who work tirelessly behind the scenes to make these virtual town halls a reality for our community. So thank you everyone much. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a long day. Um, have a good night and take care.